welcome you all at this Institute for Advanced Studies in Paris for this uh, special session of the conference on crisis of democracy, a very important question and very, uh, very present indeed. And so we are going to listen to papers uh, from great uh, thinkers of uh, democracy and of the political and of non-consensual non democracy, I think. It's going what brings them together, I guess. And uh, so first, uh, we are, uh, maybe I'll just introduce you all so we can listen to the papers in a row and then we'll have uh, a discussion. So we first uh, listen to uh, Professor Hauke Bronkhorst from the University of uh, Flensburg in Germany. Uh, and he has written many, many books, uh, especially on uh, critical theory, Adorno, and also civic friendship and uh, legal questions. Then, uh, I don't know if I should introduce the organizer of the conference, but you know, <laughs> Nancy Fraser uh, will give her paper, so uh, we don't have a Craig Calhoun, but uh, Nancy Sorry. is um, <laughs> replacing her tonight. Uh, very lucky. Uh, and uh, so I want Nancy uh, is also one of our great thinkers of uh, democracy, and she is also the person with Dominique who is bringing us all together tonight and for these two days, so I thank her very much. And then to conclude, I'm especially honored to introduce Chantal Mouffe. Chantal Mouffe is also one of the great uh, thinkers of, uh, and very provocative thinkers of democracy, and uh, she has written uh, a great number of books that are very important to us all here. And she has also in inspired many political figures in France, including uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, so, mm -hmm. <laughs> as I saw in a recent picture. And uh, so she uh, uh, has uh, written, especially uh, more recently, uh, the book on agonistics, thinking the world politically. Uh, so first, uh, we begin with uh, you, uh, Hauke. Okay. In the aftermath of the global economic crisis of 1929, heavy social struggles and a terrible global civil war, World War II, the national state finally and for the first time became democratic and social, and before the mid of the 20th century it was neither democratic, at least full-fledged democratic and social. From the beginning, this was reason enough for auto and neoliberal ideologists as Hayek to be alarmed and to prepare for a counter-revolution in advance. The democratic social state was capitalism with socialist characteristics. <laughs> the relations of production were regulated by constitutionally enabled democratic class struggle the one and only form of private property that was established by the Code Civil in 1804 became a borderline case and was broken up into hundreds, if not thousands, of forms of ownership between private and public property. Social differences decreased. The rich could no longer pay their cottages in Newport and Long Island, which were bigger than European castles, which now were used as schools and universities. The still huge class differences were compensated by mass consumption and a quickly expanding educational system that allowed much more social mobility because it was embedded in the relatively egalitarian, in quotation marks, egalitarian environment of the welfare state. And only this way it was working this educational social change. The worker drove a small car, his boss a big car, both sticking in the same jam traffic, driving to the same holiday coast, the one with a view to the sea, the other with a view to the street, and they sent their kids to the same systems of public schools, the one a little longer, the other 
a little shorter. The forest constellation was, grow was a growing pie one could give to the poor without taking too much from the rich. It appeared as if the problem of vertical, also uh, between up, uh, low and high, of vertical, social, economic, political, and cultural inequalities could be solved without changing the capitalist basic structure of modern society. However, from the beginning, this solution suffered at least from two problems, which proved to be structurally at the turn of the 1970s. The first problem was horizontal inequality. National welfareism was white, male, and heterosexual. Egalitarian democracy ended everywhere at the color line and the gender line, and oppressed and exploited white, male, and heterosexual people participated in the oppression of all other colors, genders, and sexual orientations. The revolutionary victory of democratic egalitarianism was largely at the expense of most of the world population. In the late 1960s, the global movement for civil rights, women's liberation, and, the, and, the, and against the movement against the Vietnam War made obvious that modern society was challenged not only by claims of emancipation from vertical inequalities, but also by claims uh, of emancipation from horizontal inequalities, for example, between men and women. As a new left in the 1960s emerged and the goal called for the tanks, it seemed for some time that, the, that their wildest hopes, the wildest hopes of the left came true to unite the social critique of vertical inequalities with the artist's critique of horizontal inequalities, Boltanski, Artist's critique of horizontal inequalities in a realistic project of revolutionary or radical reformism. It became realistic to ask for the impossible. But then came the crisis. The crisis brings us to the second problem. Because the crisis was not so much as neoliberal propaganda insinuated, caused by crypto communist Keynesianism but by secular stagnation. Secular stagnation was due to the finalization of the great industrial inventions like electric light, uh, um, combustion engine, uh, manipulating uh, 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 molecules, uh, mo yeah, also chemistry, and so on. Uh, and running water, very important. As Paul Sweezy has recognized already in the 1960s, growth comes under permanent threat of underconsumption. In the 1970s, there were two options for a solution of the crisis. The leftist option consisted essentially in massive redistribution that was related to vertical inequalities. And the right and second a rights revolution related to horizontal inequalities. And the option, that was a leftist option, massive redistribution and a rights revolution. And the option of the neoliberal right consisted in the finan financialization of the economy, the complementary deconstruction of the welfare state plus a neoconservative cultural rollback. The right option came to power in military coups, Chile and Argentina, electoral campaigns, Thatcher and Reagan, and heavy class struggles, struggles from above, paradigmat paradigmatic in Wales. Nearly, nearly 40 years of neoliberal globalization and reform have turned the relations of dependency between public power and private money upside down. Starker Staat ist starke Steuer. Marx once wrote, strong state is strong or heavy taxation. Neoliberal globalization was replaced by, has replaced the tax state that takes the money from the rich by the debt state 
that takes interest rates and capital from the state and in a democracy that is from the people. The workers who already had lost their mastership over the productive forces now lost their once strong unions, their collective agreements, and their right to strike became dead law in the books. In exchange, they got credits unconditioned and unlimited at the expense of a new form of debt slavery. The left could save, even enlarge, many achievements of horizontal emancipation, but at the price of vertical emancipation. In consequence, rights became privileges. Nancy would call it feminism of the 1%. <laughs> Legally, Equal rights for women, colored people, and homosexuals no longer had a fair value for those who lived in the macho, racist, and homophobe environment of the urban periphery, together with macho, racist, and homophobe police troops, once which became more and more expensive for the state to pay. Once in power, Neoliberals used public and constitutional law to deconstruct the democratic social state gradually. Socially progressive reformism was deconstructed stepwise by socially regressive reformism, but they kept the catchword reform, yeah? Regressive reform instead of progressive reform, which liberated private law from the normative constraints of public law. This is very important. Since the invention of old Roman civil law, private law was nothing else than the law of coordination of the interests of the ruling classes. Exemplary for the disembedment of private law in early 19th century are a couple of judgments of the Marshall Court in America, such as Fletcher versus Peck in 1810 and Dartmouth College versus Woodward in 1820, the judgments confirmed and reinforced by, confirmed and reinforced by Lochner versus New, New, New York 100 years later in 1905, renewed the doctrine of absolute contractual liability and expanded it to parliamentary legislation. Obligations to contract trumped parliamentary statutes. Democracy was restricted to nothing. The long pre or restricted to democracy for the ruling classes. The long pre-democratic and liberal century ended with a new deal in 1937, West Coast Hotel versus Parish in, in the court history. But the Roberts Court, the present Supreme Court of the United States, brought it back to neoliberal post-democracy. Private firms became bearers of political rights, Citizens United. Private contracts, again, were disembedded from state control, health care decision. What's left from affirmative action came under court fire recently, and the Breitbart government now has appointed Betsy DeVos as Secretary of Education to complete the regressive emancipation of private law from public law in the school system. Since the early days of Reagan and Thatcher, ever more power has been transferred from the legislators and the courts to transnationally united executive bodies. Legal formalism was bypassed by legal dynamism and the macrophysics of legally observable formal rule has been replaced by the microphysics of legally invisible informal rule. The invention of the Eurogroup, the group of the Eurozone, yeah, this, the invention of the Eurogroup at the end of this period is a good example how the new microphysics of power works. At the height of the so-called Greek crisis in June 2015, the group decided to expel the Greek Minister of Finance from an ongoing session. The minister asked for legal legitimation. The leader of the group called for his lawyers. They told him that the group did not exist legally. Therefore, it was an informal group. Yeah? Therefore, everything they did was legal. 
as long as it was in the limits of, panel, of the panel code. The entire European system of transnational and national constitutional law has become an unconscious, sophisticated design to bypass public law and public opinion. The great loser is a legislative power that once has made the French Revolution. That was a quote from Karl Marx. The legislative power has made the French Revolution. That's a long time ago. The triple U-turn from public power to private money, from public law to private law, and from legal formalism to legal dynamism had three mayor effects. First, long-term high profit rates, but second, only small growth close to stagnation, and because of both, three dramatically increasing differences between social classes. Contrary to the neoliberal expectation that increasing social differences improve competitiveness and innovation, they caused a deep crisis of motivation. The reason for this is that the huge, that huge social differences destroy all hope for the have-nots and, and their children, that's important, for the have-nots and their children to change their stigmatized, bleak, and depressing social situation. The crisis of motivation has not only further negative effects on growth, but also on political equality, as it has been shown by very uh, uh, clear, shown by a couple of empirical studies. With increasing inequality, the turnout of the lower, middle, and underclasses shrinks successively down to 30% and less, whereas the upper class turnout goes up high in the 90s. Then leftist parties lose their voters. Therefore, they move further right from election to election. A huge empty space left from center right emerges and finally is occupied by the far right. We are left with a grim prospect to choose between right parties of market fundamentalism plus PC culture, Clinton, Blair, Schröder, Hollande, and far right parties of market fundamentalism plus a nationalist, racist, and religiously fundamentalist cultural background, Trump, Johnson, Petri, Le Pen. No wonder that terrorism, fueled by new imperialist wars, becomes a global pretext to authoritarian, to authoritarian, uh, sorry, uh, no wonder that terrorism becomes a global pretext to go authoritarian long before the authoritarian parties come to power. First comes homeland security, then the Breitbart fascists. And if Le Pen wins the next election, she must not declare the state of siege because it is already there. This gives me the opportunity to quote Marx again, a splendid invention periodically employed in every ensuing crisis in the course of the French Revolution that of itself made its way over the whole continent, but returned to France with ever-renewed love the state of siege, freeing civil society completely from the trouble of governing itself. Postscript. However, one word, however, anyway, back to the national state in a globalized capitalist world society is as closed as a road to the artisan skills in the 19th century. The, the road back to the artists and skills in the 19th century. In the same way as it made no sense for the workers of the 19th century to stick with the guilds in a world dominated by national capital, it makes no sense for us to stick with the national state in a world of dom dom dominated by global capital. Therefore, the complete refoundation of a social Europe that unites the social critique of vertical inequalities with the artist's critique of horizontal inequalities 
seems to be the only way out of the crisis of democracy, even if the chances to realize it have become extremely small, it is the only Europe worth to fight. Thank you. Shall I go? Well, um, that was uh, really interesting, and it, um, it actually dovetails uh, very closely to what I'm going to say. I think we're very much on the same page. I want to suggest that we are facing, as Halka has said, a very deep crisis of democracy. And I would say that it is a crisis on at least two levels. There is, first of all, a structural and institutional crisis. And a, a great deal of what Halka said is relevant to that level. The idea is basically that uh, for structural reasons, our political institutions are unable to produce the decisions and the solutions that we need to address all of our many uh, pressing problems, ecological problems, social problems, inequality problems. Um, and they are unable to produce those solutions for non-accidental reasons that I'll try to explain. This is the case at all levels of government, national, regional, and global. Secondly, however, there's another level of this crisis of democracy, and I will call it a hegemonic crisis or a legitimation crisis. And that is the collapse of popular confidence in all of the established political parties, political elites, political classes. This goes with the delegitimation of what has been uh, for uh, several decades now the hegemonic uh, political world view and the hegemonic ruling bloc. I'm going to call that uh, progressive neoliberalism, but it fits uh, very nicely with uh, Halka's account. So I want to say uh, a, a bit about the crisis at each of these two levels, beginning with the structural institutional level. Here, I think what I have to say um, echoes uh, a great deal of uh, Hauke's remarks. I understand this crisis to essentially be the hollowing out of public power at all levels by private powers. And by private powers, I mean above all multinational corporations with a global reach. That's the lovely phrase of Colin Crouch, very accurate. And the power of global finance. Uh, I um, uh, understand this hollowing out of public power by private power to be the expression in our time of what I will call the political contradiction of capitalism. The, this contradiction can be summarized as follows. On the one hand, legitimate, efficacious public power is an absolutely necessary condition of possibility for sustained capital accumulation. A capitalist economy cannot exist in the absence of legitimate, efficacious public power. But at the same time, and on the other hand, capitalism's drive to endless accumulation tends periodically to destabilize the very public power on which it relies. It eats it away. Now, this political contradiction of capitalism I think is inherent in capitalism as such. Nevertheless, it assumes a different form in every historically specific phase of capitalist society. And the, the contradictions, uh, the difficulties that Hauke has just described, I would say, represent the especially acute form that this political contradiction of capitalism assumes today in the present financialized, globalizing, neoliberal capitalism of our time, which of course differs from earlier forms of capitalist societies. What lies behind this contradiction is the peculiar separation in capitalist society of the political from the economic. Earlier societies merged political and economic power in various forms, but capitalism, importantly, split the two apart. It 
privatized the power to organize production and devolved that uh, power to capital while uh, assigning the, the governance of the remaining non-economic orders uh, to the public power. In capitalism, in effect, the economic is defined as non-political and the political is defined as non-economic. So this separation of economy from polity is a, in my view, a defining structural feature of capitalist society. And yet it goes with something else, with the simultaneous mutual dependence of public power and private power. They are separate and yet mutually dependent. And that peculiar relation of separation plus dependence is, in my view, a built-in source of, in of potential instability. On the one hand, capitalist economic production is not self-sustaining, but relies on public power, including not only the, the private uh, contract law and so on that, that Halka uh, mentioned, but also the repressive forces needed to quell dissent, and uh, even at the international level, forms of treaty-based or uh, governance structure-based coordination that enable international trade, transnationalized production, and all the forms of economic life that cross borders. So on the other hand, as I said, the orientation to endless accumulation threatens periodically to destabilize the very political capacities that capital needs, and over time can uh, really cause trouble. Often, of course, capitalism's political contradiction is muted, and this crisis tendency remains under wraps. It becomes acute, however, when capital's drive toward boundless accumulation becomes unmoored from political control and turns against its own conditions of possibility. In that case, economy overruns polity, eating away at public power, destabilizing the very political agencies on which it depends. And in a sense that, uh, in a nutshell, that is, I, I think, what has happened today. We get, as a result, an institutional crisis in which public powers lack the necessary heft to govern effectively. They are outgunned by private powers, such as large transnational corporations. They are blocked from making and implementing the policies needed to solve social problems. For example, global warming and the regulation of global finance. We do not have the public powers that would be necessary to solve those problems. A second uh, a result of all of this could be, uh, and I would say is today, a crisis of hegemony in which public opinion turns against a dysfunctional system that fails to deliver. In that case, popular forces withdraw legitimation from existing arrangements and uh, try uh, in one way or another to redraw uh, the institutional map. Now, I, I think I don't need to repeat in uh, great detail um, many of the symptoms and institutional features of this uh, structural crisis because Halka has uh, serendipitously and, and happily uh, done that for me. But in a nutshell, I would say that central banks and global financial institutions have replaced states in many respects as the principal arbiters of an increasingly globalized economy. It is they and not states who now make a major share of the rules that govern the central relations of capitalist society, the relations between labor and capital, citizens and states, core and periphery, production and reproduction, society and nature, and increasingly crucial for all of those, another point that Hauke mentioned, the relations between debtors and creditors. I would say that that last uh, relation is central to financialized capitalism and permeates all of the other relations. It is largely through debt now that capital cannibalizes labor, disciplines states imposing austerity. It is by debt that it transfers wealth from periphery to core, sucks value from society and nature. 
as debt flows through states, regions, communities, households, and firms, it affects a dramatic shift in the relation between economy and polity that prevailed in the previous form of capitalism, state-managed capitalism, or New Deal social democratic capitalism, whatever you like. Whereas that previous regime empowered states to subordinate the short-term interests of private firms to the long-term objective of sustained accumulation, this regime authorizes finance capital to discipline states and publics in the immediate interests of private investors. And the result is a double whammy. On the one hand, the state institutions that were previously at least somewhat responsive to citizens are decreasingly capable of addressing the latter's problems. On the other hand, the central banks and global financial institutions that have hobbled state capacities are, as they proudly boast, politically independent, meaning unaccountable to publics, free to act on behalf of investors and creditors. Meanwhile, as I said, the scale of pressing problems such as global warming, the refugee crisis, the financial instability exceeds the reach and heft of public powers. They are overmatched by transnational corporations and global financial flows which elude control by political agencies that remain tethered to a bounded territory. And this is why we hear the proliferation in financialized capitalism of this whole raft of terms, de-democratization, post-democracy, facade democracy, zombie democracy, these are all symptomatic uh, descriptions of this new nexus of polity and economy. Well, uh, let me move uh, to my second uh, uh, point. Um, uh, because, I mean, what I've said so far is that the overall effect of, uh, uh, here is to hollow out public power to narrow political agendas, both by external fiat, the demands of the markets, the bond rating agencies who say you can't do this, you can't do that, to states, by internal co-optation of public powers through corporate capture, through privatization, through the spread of neoliberal political rationality. We spoke earlier at our workshop about the proliferation of various regimes of, of assessment of uh, public programs, which mean judge them, judging them by uh, economic criteria of uh, efficiency. Matters that were once squarely considered within the purview of democratic political action, such as labor and environmental regulation, are now declared off limits because they are restraints on free trade uh, or uh, they are devolved to the markets to the benefit of finance and corporate capital. In this brave new world of financialized capitalism, public powers cannot deliver solutions to those in whose name they govern. Okay, here is, I come now to my sort of second point, hegemonic crisis. Until recently, the structural difficulties that I have just described elicited a fair amount of social protest, but very little in the way of political revolt, and that has now changed. Today, we face a series of dramatic political uprisings that together signal a true crisis of neoliberal hegemony. I'm thinking of the Brexit vote in the UK, the rejection of the Renzi reforms in Italy. In the US, we, uh, of course, there's the uh, election of Trump, but let's not forget the Bernie Sanders campaign for, for the Democratic Party nomination during the primary season here in France, rising support for the National Front. Certainly all of these revolts, if you like, differ in ideology and goals, but they share a common target. All are rejections of corporate globalization and neoliberalism and of the political establishments that promoted them. In every case, voters are saying no to the lethal combination of austerity, free trade, predatory debt, and precarious ill-paid work that characterize financialized capitalism today and to the disabling of public power to address those issues. 
their votes are a response to the structural crisis of this for, excuse me, form of capitalism. Nevertheless, and here again, I approach Hauke. It's very interesting to see us coming at these things uh, from somewhat different angles but converging. These are not rebellions solely against global finance. What voters have rejected, certainly in the case of Trump, was not neoliberalism simpliciter, but what I have called progressive neoliberalism. This may sound like a contradiction in terms, but it is a real, if perverse, political alignment that I think holds the key to understanding the Trump victory in the US and might also shed some light on developments elsewhere. You'll tell me whether it's helpful for the French case. In its US form, progressive neoliberalism is, was, uh, still is, an alliance of mainstream currents of new social movements, feminism, anti-racism, multiculturalism, and LGBTQ rights, but in distinctively liberal forms that benefit a very thin stratum of population and not the, uh, the whole uh, of, these, uh, 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 of the members uh, who could be in those groups, an alliance between those currents of new social movements on the one side and the high-end symbolic and cognitive and service-based business sectors such as Wall Street, Silicon Valley, and Hollywood on the other side. In this alliance, progressive forces are effectively joined with the forces of cognitive capitalism and especially the senior partner in all of this financialization. However, unwittingly, they lend their charisma to the latter. Ideals like diversity and empowerment, which could, in principle, serve different ends, now serve to gloss policies that have devastated manufacturing and what were once considered in the US the middle class lives of our working classes. Progressive neoliberalism mixed together truncated ideals of emancipation with lethal forms of financialization. And it was that mix that was rejected in toto by those who voted for Trump. Prominent among those left behind in this brave new cosmopolitan world were industrial workers, and not just workers, but all uh, who relied on industry in the Rust Belt and in the industrializing, newly industrializing areas of the South as well as rural populations devastated by unemployment and drugs. For these populations, the injury of deindustrialization was compounded by the insult of progressive cosmopolitan superiority, which routinely cast them as morally and culturally backward. Rejecting globalization, Trump voters also repudiated the liberal cosmopolitanism that was identified with it. For some of them, by, but by no means all, it was a short step to blaming their worsening conditions on political correctness, people of color, immigrants, Mexicans, and Muslims. In their eyes, feminists and Wall Street were birds of a feather, perfectly united in the person of Hillary Clinton. I think that there was a moment at which these working class voters were really up for grabs and could have been won by the left. In fact, many of them did support Bernie Sanders. But by the time of our general election, the left alternative had been suppressed and what remained was a Hobson's choice between reactionary populism on the one side and progressive neoliberalism on the other. That choice, I think, is being offered elsewhere as well. Uh, you'll tell me again if it's a fair description of the choice you may be facing here in France. If it is, in any case, it is a choice that I believe should be forthrightly and directly refused. It is a choice that assumes we have to choose between social protection and emancipation, or in Hauke's terms, fighting horizontal inequalities and vertical inequalities that we can't combine those two projects in a single one. But I think that is wrong. We can indeed uh, combine them, but that requires refusing the terms that are being presented to us by the political classes, working to redefine them by drawing on the vast and growing fund 
of social revulsion against the present order. Rather than siding with financialization cum emancipation, which is the progressive neoliberal formula against social protection, the reactionary populist idea, we should be building a new alliance of emancipation and social protection against financialization. In fact, that is how I understood the project of Bernie Sanders. It's a project in which emancipation does not mean diversifying the corporate hierarchy, but rather abolishing it. Prosperity does not mean rising share value or corporate profit, but the material prerequisites of a good life for all. I think that combination is the only principled and willing response in the current conjuncture. I'm not shedding any tears for the defeat of progressive neoliberalism. I think it is actually offering us not only a lot of danger, which it is, but also some opportunity the chance to build a new, new left, uh, one that, again, uh, combines the project of social protection with emancipation uh, and uh, could unite that portion of the Trump voting base that are not dyed-in-the-wool racist, fascist, and neocons, and I think there are many, with uh, the... Um, the populations who voted against him. I think that's the only winning uh, political scenario and uh, the only way uh, to begin to rebuild public power. But this has to also be done on an international level because, as I said, the powers that we actually need to solve many of our problems exceed the heft even of a, a, a mega uh, superpower like the United States. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid this panel is not going to be very agonistic <laughs> because uh, we uh, uh, um, are the three of us on the same wavelength. But, uh, of course, we uh, approach the issue from different angles. So let's hope that, you know, it's going to be complementary. And, of course, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, everybody will agree with my uh, uh, conclusion. But uh, I think, basically, you know, there will not be any uh, strong disagreement and, and quite a lot of overlap, in fact. Um, I, I, I am, in fact, going to center on the one specific question, uh, which I call the populist challenge. It is for some time known that voices have warned us of the danger of populism presented as a perversion of democracy. However, with the victory of the Brexiteers in the UK and Trump unexpected success in the United States, the denunciation of populism has become more strident. Members of the establishment have seemingly begun to worry about the potential for social discontent they have so far overlooked. We have ended by alarmist statement claiming that populism must be eliminated because it constitutes a deadly threat to democracy. They believe that the demonization of populism and the fear of a possible return of fascism will be sufficient to prevent the growth of parties and movement that call into question the neoliberal consensus. So on that point, we agree. It's important to examine what's at stake in the emergence in recent years of the movement called populist. It is imperative to put forward a serene analysis of the current state of our democracies in order to visualize ways to strengthen democratic institutions against the danger which they are exposed. Those dangers are real, but they result from the abandonment by those parties presenting themselves as democratic of the principle of popular sovereignty and equality that are constitutive of democratic politics. With the rise of neoliberalism, these principles have been relegated to zombie categories, and this is why our societies have entered a post-democratic era. So I think we agree on, on that point. But I want to scrutinize a little bit more this question of post-democracy from a philosophical 
political uh, angle. Because what is meant exactly by post-democracy? I mean, there are many uh, understandings. I mean, Colin Croce has presented one, but mine is going to be a, a little bit uh, different. Of course, it's complementary, but I want to put the emphasis on something uh, uh, different, more political. And I think we, uh, 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 we need to begin by clarifying the meaning of democracy. As it is known, etymologically speaking, democracy comes from the Greek, I don't uh, uh, tell you new, anything new, demos kratos, which means power of the demos, of the people. It is a principle of legitimacy that is not exercised in the abstract, but instead through specific institutions. When we speak of democracy in Europe, and in the West in general, we refer to a specific model, the Western model, that results from the inscription of the democratic ideal in a particular historical context. This model, which of course has received uh, several uh, names, modern democracy, representative democracy, parliamentary democracy, constitutional democracy, liberal democracy, for my part I prefer to speak of pluralist democracy, is characterized by the articulation of two different traditions. On the one hand, the tradition of political liberalism, I insist on political liberalism, the rule which means the rule of law, the separation of power, and the defense of individual freedom. That's on one side. On the other hand, the democratic tradition, whose central ideas are equality and popular sovereignty. Contrary to what is sometimes said, there is no necessary relationship between those two traditions, but only a contingent historical articulation, which, as C.B. McPherson, the, the Canadian political theorist, has shown, took place in the 19th century through the joint struggle of the liberals and the democrats against absolutist regime. In one of my books, The Democratic Paradox, I've proposed to conceive the articulation of these two traditions, which of course is a low, old debate in political uh, philosophy about are they compatible or not, uh, Carl Schmitt versus Habermas, but uh, uh, my, my position is to uh, see them, uh, their articulation on the mode of what I call a paradoxical configuration. And as the locus of a tension that defines the originality of liberal democracy and guarantees its pluralistic character. The democratic logic of constructing a people and defending equalitarian practices is necessary to define a demos and to subvert the tendency of liberal discourse to abstract universalism. But its articulation with the liberal logic allows us to challenge the form of exclusion that are inherent in the political practice of determining the people who will govern. Democratic liberal politics consists of a constant process of negotiation through different hegemonic configuration of this constitutive tension. This tension, which I think is, uh, we can see as expressed in political terms along the frontier between right and left, because I think, uh, for instance, Norberto Bobbio has shown clearly that if there is a meaning to the, the fundamental to the right is to privilege its liberty and to the left is to privilege equality. So there is, of course, a tension because perfect liberty and perfect equality cannot exist. There is always a lexical, as we saw in philosophy, relation between the two. But I think this, and this is, of course, expressed through the, the con, uh, confrontation between uh, left and right. Uh, but, and this, of course, can only be stabilized temporarily through pragmatic negotiation between political forces. Those negotiations always establish the hegemony of one of them. Revisiting the history of pluralistic liberal democracy, we can find on some occasion the liberal logic prevail, and while in others it was the democratic one. Nonetheless, and I think that's very important, the two logic remain in force. There was always, you know, uh, they were present. It was dominant, but always present. And the possibility of what I call an agonistic negotiation between right and left, which I see as specific to the liberal democratic regime, this always remained, this agonistic negotiation. If the current situation can be described as 
post-democracy, from the point of view of political theory, it is because in recent years, with the weakening of the democratic values as a consequence of the implementation of neoliberal hegemony, this constitutive tension has been eliminated and the agonistic spaces where different projects of society could confront each other have disappeared. In the political arena, this evolution was made manifest through what I've proposed uh, in a book called On the Political to call post-politics, to refer to the blurring of the political frontier between the right and the left. By that term, post-politics, I mean the consensus established between center-right and center-left parties on the idea that there was no alternative to neoliberal globalization. Under the pretext of modernization imposed by globalization, social democratic parties accepted the dictat of financial capitalism and the, the limit that they impose on state intervention or on redistributive policies. The role of parliaments and institutions that allow citizens to influence political decisions was drastically reduced, and citizens have been deprived of the possibility of exercising their democratic rights. Elections no longer offer any opportunity to decide on real alternatives through the traditional parties. Elect, uh, uh, politics has become a mere technical issue of managing the established order, the domain which, of course, is reserved to experts. The only thing that post-politics allows is a bipartisan alternation in power between the center-right and the center-left. All those who oppose this consensus at the center and per are perceived as extremists and described as populists. Popular sovereignty has been declared obsolete and democracy has been reduced to its liberal component. And thus, one of the fundamental pillars of the democratic ideal was undermined, the power of the people, popular sovereignty. To be sure, democracy is still spoken of, but only to indicate the existence of election and the defense of human rights. These changes at the political level, if taken place in the context of a new mode of capitalist regulation, in which financial capital occupies a central place. I mean, a lot of have been said about that but, uh, in the true pre first presentation. With the financialization of the economy, there was a great expansion of the financial sector at the cost of the productive economy. Under the combined effect of deindustrialization, the promotion of technical change, and the process of delocalization to countries where labor was cheaper, many jobs were lost. Privatization and deregulation policies also contributed to creating a situation of endemic unemployment, and workers found themselves in increasingly difficult conditions. If one adds to that the effects of the austerity policies that were imposed after the 2008 crisis, one can understand the causes of the exponential increase of the inequalities that we have witnessed in several European countries particularly in the South. This inequality no longer affects only the working class, but also a large part of the middle class, which have entered into a process of pauperization and precarization. The problem is that social democratic parties have in fact accompanied this development, and in many places they have even played an important role in the implementation of neoliberal policies. This contributed to the fact that the other pillar of the democratic ideal, the defense of equality, has also been eliminated from the liberal democratic discourse. What is no, the rule is an individual liberal vision that celebrates consumer society and the freedom that the market offer. The result, the result, sorry, of neoliberal hegemony was in the, uh, uh, um, then the establishment both socioeconomically and politically of what can be called a truly oligarchic regime. It is precisely this oligarchization, oligarchization of European society that is at the origin of the success of right-wing populist parties. And this is you know, one of my central theses. As a matter of fact, those right-wing populist parties are often the only ones who denounce this situation 
promising to defend the people against our globalization, promising to give them back the power that had been confiscated by the elites. Translating social problems into an ethnic vocabulary, in many countries they've articulated in a xenophobic vocabulary the demands of the popular sector, which were ignored by the parties of the center because, of course, they were incompatible with the neoliberal project. The Social Democratic parties, prisoners of this post-political uh, situation and their post-political dogma, and re are reluctant to admit their mistake, and they refuse to recognize that many of those demands are, in fact, legitimate democratic demands. And those are demands to which a progressive answer must be given. And this, of course, explains their inability to grasp the nature of the populist challenge. In order to appreciate this challenge, it is necessary, because of course, here I think you know, we speak of populism, but obviously uh, I'm going to speak of populism in a very special uh, understanding of the term. Because I think it's, of course, necessary to reject the simplistic vision disseminated by the media, which brands populism as a pure demagoguery. The analytical perspective developed by Ernesto Laclau offers us, I think, important theoretical tools to address this question of populism. He defines populism as a way of constructing the political, which consists in establishing a political frontier that divides society into two camps, calling for the mobilization of the underdog against those in power. Populism, insists uh, Ernesto Laclau, is not an ideology. It cannot be attributed to specific programmatic content, nor is it a political regime, and it can take various forms according to time and places. And it is compatible with a variety of institutional forms. Populism refers to the dimension of popular sovereignty and to the construction of a demos, and this, of course, is constitutive of democracy. It is precisely this dimension that has been discarded by neoliberal hegemony, and that is why the fight against post-democracy requires, in my view, a populist political intervention. The populist moment we are witnessing offers us the opportunity to re-establish a political frontier that allow us to recreate the agonistic tension typical of democracy. In fact, several right-wing populist parties are already doing so to reestablish the frontier against post-politics. And of course, this is what explains their recent progress. The strength of right-wing populism can be explained precisely because it was able in many countries to draw a frontier and construct a people in order to translate politically the various resistances to the phenomenon of oligarchization induced by neoliberal hegemony. Its appeal is particularly notable within the working class, but it's also growing within the middle class affected by the new structure of domination linked to neoliberal globalization. Unfortunately, so far the response of the progressive forces has not been adequate. They have been influenced by the discourse of the establishment forces which disqualified populism in order to maintain their domination. They continue to advocate traditional political strategies unsuited to the deep crisis of legitimacy that affects liberal democratic regime. This crisis is the expression of a very, very heterogeneous demand which cannot be formulated through the right, left cleavage as traditionally configured. Unlike the struggle characteristic of the era of Fordism capitalism, when there was a working class defending specific interests, in post for this neoliberal capitalism, resistances have developed in many points outside the productive process. These demands no longer correspond to social sector defined in sociological terms and by their location in the social structure. Many are claimed that touch on questions related to the quality of life and have a transversal character. The demand linked to the struggle against sexism, racism, and other forms of domination have also become increasingly central 
And in order to articulate such diversity of heterogeneous demand in a collective will, the traditional left-right frontier no longer works. To federate those diverse struggles and diverse demands, it is necessary to establish a synergy between social movement and party forms with the objective of constructing a people and for that, a frontier constructed in a politic, populist way is required. And this is why I think we are at the time in which the way to fight against post-democracy is constructing a populist frontier. This does not mean, and I want to insist on that, that the left-right opposition is no longer relevant, but it must be posed in another way, with reference on the type of populism at stake and the chance of equivalence through which the people is constructed. Understood as a political category, of course, the people always result from a discursive construction. The people is not something there that exists. That's the population, but the people is a political construction. And, of course, this different uh, uh, form in which the people are constructed uh, result from the way in which the we does is constructed, the we around which it crystallizes can be constructed in many different ways, depending on its constituent elements and, of course, also how the day who the people confront is defined. This is, for instance, the difference between right-wing populism, such as one of Marine Le Pen uh, in France, who construct a people that is limited to the true national, excluding immigrants who are related, relegated to the dem along the anti-nation forces of the elites, and a progressive left-wing populism, like the one of Jean-Luc Mélenchon, with a broader conception of the we that includes immigrants, environmental movement, and all you know those called minority struggle, uh, defining they, the, the they, as the set of forces whose politics promote social inequality, all the you know, nodal points of neoliberalism. In the first case, we are based with an authoritarian uh, face, with an authoritarian populism whose objective is, in fact, a restriction of democracy. While in the second case, it is a populism that aspires to broaden and radicalize democracy. In addition to how the people are constructed, you know, the us, them, another important question must be considered in order to distinguish between various forms of populism. And it is the way in which the relation between the people and the, those in power, the establishment, is conceived. Collective identities always require the distinction we they. That's one of the, my claim in all of my work. But the political f in, in the political field, the frontier between the we and the they indicates always the presence of an antagonism. That is, and that by antagonism, I mean a conflict that cannot have a rational solution. That antagonism, however, can manifest itself in different forms. It can take either the form of a friend and enemy confrontation, in which the goal is to eradicate the day to establish a radically new order. For instance, I think we can say that the French Revolution provides an example of this antagonistic form of populism. But that confrontation can also take place in what I call an agonistic way, where the day are not seen as an enemy, but as an adversary, against whom, of course, we are going to fight, but through uh, democratic means. For a populist movement to be compatible with pluralist democracy, and this is, I think, the case in uh, 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 Western Europe, the, and probably, I will argue also the, in the US, the confrontation must be an agonistic one. An agonistic populism does not advocate total rejection of the existing institutional framework. Its objective is not the destruction of the liberal democratic institution, but the, the disarticulation of the elements that constitute the hegemonic order, the rearticulation of a new hegemony, and of course something that whose objective is the radicalization of democracy. A left populism suitable to the European situation must be conceived as a radical reformism, which strives to recover and deepen democracy. 
It is a struggle that is carried out by means of what Gramsci called a war of position within the institution in order to transform them. A struggle that indeed will require significant institutional changes to allow the popular will to be expressed. But those changes do not pose a radical challenge to the democratic institution. That, I mean, it means it does not require a revolution. You know, it's not the Jacobin moment. It's a pro immanent critique of pluralist democracy. So it's not a question of ending representative democracy, but of strengthening the institution that give voice to the people. I would say that it's a form of plebeian republicanism that is inscribed in the democratic lineage of the republican tradition whose precursor was Machiavelli. I'm convinced that in the next year, the central axis of the political conflict will be between right-wing and left-wing populism. And it is imperative that progressive sectors understand the importance of involving themselves in that struggle. To devise a left populism requires visualizing politics in a way that recognizes its partisan character. We must discard the dominant rationalist perspective in liberal democratic political thinking and recognize, and I want to insist on that point particularly, the importance of affects in politics, because this is something which is crucial in populism. And by, by uh, affects, I insist on, the, in fact, the common affects. And this is what I call passion, because this is crucial in the cre formation of collective identities. And of course, the way in which uh, us, we, is going to crystallize is around you know, common affects. It is, true, it is through the construction of an other people, a collective will, that result from the mobilization of the passion in defense of equality and social justice, that it will be possible to combat the xenophobic policies promoted by right-wing populism. By recreating political frontiers, the populist moment that we are witnessing in Europe and in the US points, in a sense, I would say, to a return of the political a return that may open the way for authoritarian solution through regime that weaken liberal democratic institution, but which can also lead to a reaffirmation and a deepening of democratic values. Everything will depend on the kind of populism that emerged victorious from the struggle against post politics and post democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much to you all for three wonderful papers and very exciting and very relevant for us, especially for us now uh, in France in this uh, presidential election. So I'm very grateful, even if you have a very uh, decentral, non-consensual conception of democracy, but actually this uh, panel was kind of consensual, so it's a little <laughs> paradoxical. But still, maybe you disagree on a few points, maybe on this populist uh, uh, conception. Uh, maybe you are not exactly on the same page. Uh, and uh, also uh, about the idea of uh, strengthening democracy as being the only way to go, uh, or um, maybe some of you have the idea that democracy and the crisis of democracy, which is our subject now, but that democracy is somehow completely doomed now, also because the motto, the democracy is also claimed by people who do not uh, represent democracy at all. So this is something for us in France that is uh, kind of disturbing too, so I would like to know what you think uh, uh, about that too. Uh, so um, anyway, I'm sure there are many questions and uh, I, you, you can ask your questions uh, in French too because uh, our friends here understand French. Vous pouvez poser vos questions en français aussi, puisque Tout le monde comprend, non, pas toi. Oui. On peut traduire, je te traduis, parce que pour que ça soit plus facile, la discussion, euh, les, les interventions, 
euh, n'hésitez pas donc à poser vos questions en français et euh, nos amis répondront en anglais, hein, de, puisque vous avez pu comprendre l'exposé. Je pense que vous pourrez comprendre leur réponse. Euh, donc, euh, Dominique, tu peux parler en français si tu vas te soulager. <rire> Merci beaucoup à tous les trois. C'était une question pour Chantal. Dans cette conception agonistique des, 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 des relations, euh, moi, il me semble que ce combat entre les différentes parties de la société, il est très inégal. Et le hiérarchie, elle n'a aucun intérêt à se laisser faire. Et elle a beaucoup plus de. Il y a un rapport de force complètement inégal. Elle dispose de plus de ressources. Elle n'a aucun intérêt à, à céder. Donc, dans ce cas-là, qu'est-ce qu'on fait <rire> Non, euh, non, mais bon, c'est évident, c'est pourquoi je... Euh, euh, bon, d'abord, je crois qu'il est important de, de créer une volonté collective... Uh, uh, un, 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 un English, I suppose, yes. Uh, uh, no, I, 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 of course, the, 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 the relation of forces are uh, uh, unequal. But I do believe uh, uh, that if... Uh, You know, the left was uh, able to create a very strong uh, collective will, uh, wanting to uh, put, uh, well, the, the, it's, we could say that today uh, a neoliberal, even this I think that uh, relates to what was saying before, it's a moment of crisis. Isn't it? They are not in, in the, the moment in which, you know, let's say, Since the 2008 crisis, we are beginning to realize that uh, there the, the are problems with serious problems with neoliberalism. So I think that it will be possible definitively to bring uh, uh, to, together a very uh, strong uh, uh, collective will in order to uh, uh, fight through democratic means, through, uh, uh, for instance, I, I, it's a bit of a big, big debate about that uh, in, in, uh, in Spain with Podemos. You know, they are, is it possible? through uh, um, only the parliament, so you are in parliament, to uh, transform society. And of course, they say, no, you, what you need is to have, this is what I insist, that for me, a, pop, a left-wing populism must be the articulation between social movement and, and the party firm. You know, the, the, the synergy between the, what I, we can call the vertical, the vertical and, and the horizontal. Because obviously, uh, and, and that's something that uh, people in Podemos are very aware of, is not only through it in the parliament, because in parliament, you know, the, the relations are, are definitively a constru it's all constructed in order to keep them you know, in, in the margin. But by a, a, a struggle, both in the level of parliament and that uh, uh, supported by strong popular mobilization, you know, it, it should be possible. I, I, I do believe that uh, uh, the, uh, for a transformation, an hegemonic transformation is, is possible. Uh, uh, and in fact, I, uh, you are going to find that may, may, may be a, a little bit uh, uh, curious, but In a sense, and I, and I think that what we could imagine is something similar to what Margaret Thatcher did. Margaret, no, but Margaret Thatcher managed to, I, I've lived through that in, 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 in Britain, and when I arrived in Britain, it was definitely uh, uh, under social democratic hegemony. You know, and, 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 and I've seen the way in which Margaret Thatcher has manic, managed to transform the relation of forces to win the support of some part of the, of, of the uh, uh, working class and transform relation of power. So I think that what is re really needed is to transform, you know, to do exactly the reverse of what Margaret Thatcher did, to transform, uh, to create a new hegemony. And I insist that this not require a complete, you know, revolutionary break. But of course, when I speak of radical reformism, I'm not, uh, this is why I insist it is some form of reforming in the sense that it is something is an, uh, uh, and, and here, for instance, I, 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 um, my uh, struggle is with the kind of radical politics proposed by people like Art and Negri, you know, exodus. They say, no, what we should need to do is to leave aside the terrain of parliament that we create, 
you know, outside a completely new world, the self-organization of, of the multitude. You know, I, in fact, uh, very much uh, uh, the, the, the final strategy of what I call engagement with the institution in order, in order to transform them. So this is, Thank in you. that sense, a strategy mm -hmm. of reforming that I think the institution can be transformed. But, of course, it's radical <laughs> in the sense that at some point, we are going to have... Chantal, oui. We have many questions. Yeah, so yeah, I'm just, just finishing. I'm <laughs> just you. finishing. Sorry. Uh, uh, at some point, of course, there will be moment of rupture. You know, the mo it's not one big rupture, but there will be a moment of rupture because I agree with you. The the the, the establishment is not going to li leave. You know, without struggle. Merci. Thank you. Uh, Javi, Monsieur. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I'm I'm not a philosopher, politician, or any kind of life scientist. And I dabble a lot in technology. And uh, I've heard lots of words spoken by you, and, and I've misunderstood many of them. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I'm here to, to listen about democracy, and, and I hear the elites. And I don't understand them. And I think that may be one of your problems. But the, the second problem that we have is that uh, you know, most of us do politics to improve life. So let, let's just look at the evidence uh, of this bankrupt politics that we have at the moment. Um, I was just noting things. And we feed about a third more of the population than we used to, even though the population has doubled in the last 50 years. People, people... <laughs> oh, yes. People have come out of the poverty level uh, throughout large swathes of the world. And um, health has been massively improved, uh, as judged by the length of life going up from about 40 to 80 or 90 over the last 60 or 70 years. Global warming is being changed. Holes in the atmosphere are changing as a result of the current politics. Social mobility in countries outside the US or Europe is very great. Is it perhaps that they're looking at a diversity which is looking at the advanced world against the less advanced world? The world which um, robbed the rest of the world over the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries of its wealth and distributed it amongst itself. Um, technology okay. and communications. And the, we have a fourth speaker, actually. I didn't know it. And the stroke <laughs> reversed the problem of the, um, the way the blacks were, uh, were treated. Okay. I mean, there's now, so, a, there's now a massive go, uh, revolt against that, but uh, doesn't that speak more of the local situation in the United States than anything else? So, okay. I, um, so, what is your question, please? Like okay. Thank you. Being re-established in European waters by a large and You answer, Nancy. You answer. So, th these, are, these are positive facts, and you've talked about lots of negative things. The only thing that I did hear, two things encouraged me. One was someone talked about the diversity of politics. And I would think that different contexts different parts of the world require different types of politics. But I only heard one prediction from all of you, and that was uh, from our last speaker, who said there will be a battle between right and left. And I sort of fear that Karl Marx used to say things like that 150 years ago. There will be a I think we understand the question. I'm going to try to respond to at least some of it, okay? I'll tell you. I'll tell think, tell you. I think Marx was right, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you for your uh, comments. Um, I want to say uh, several things. Um, I think that the, the point uh, where I would uh, agree with you has to do with um, exactly where we are talking about some declines in poverty rates and some uh, increases in longevity. The data that I know says that the almost a, 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 the lion's share of these improvements have to do with China, nowhere else. 
And this is, just a minute, no, 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 no. We, we have Africans here who are participating in, in our conference. They can tell you about it. Please don't interrupt me. I let you speak for a long time now. I'm going to answer you, okay? Please be quiet. Give the microphone back. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, China accounts for uh, the lion's share of uh, declines in absolute poverty and increases in longevity. And this is actually not due to recent Chinese market reforms, but to the sort of long uh, coming to fruition of uh, earlier uh, uh, regimes in China, a communist regime that actually built something like a developmental state. China, even today, is not a neoliberal state. We are talking about the shift from developmental states and state-managed forms of capitalism to neoliberalism, which uh, have given very negative examples. The life expectancy of white men in the United States is dropping. It is not going up. Uh, we don't even need to talk about li uh, dropping life expectancy in uh, Russia, which is a, a total uh, uh, disaster. Obama did not reverse the bad treatment of blacks in the United States. He continued and ramped up deportations, the prison industrial complex, and proceeded over the Goldman Sachsization, if I can call it that, of our economy, begun by Bill Clinton, another progressive neoliberal, uh, which decimated manufacturing and is now uh, led. Th this is what enabled Trump. It's wrong to see Obama the good guy, Trump the bad guy. This is a process. It's path dependent. One leads to the other. And uh, I want to just um, add uh, a point. Since you uh, agreed with um, Chantal Mouffe, or, or you cited her prediction that the coming conflict will be between, between, between right-wing and left-wing populism, I have to say that that's not how I see it uh, shaping up in the United States. The current conflict is about what counts as resistance to Trump. Does resistance aim to restore the status quo ante, which is probably what the majority of people in the streets, uh, maybe they're not consciously aiming at, but that's where they're sort of drifting, or does it mean a major uh, restructuring of society and of the form of capitalism? And that's the opening. Uh, I, I would say that if I had to predict that the most likely outcome of this resistance, because I don't think Trump is a stable uh, solution to anything. He's, I don't think he's going to last all that long. Uh, I would say the most likely outcome is some kind of reconstitution of progressive neoliberalism. And I think that's where we have to train our fire in the United States, to be working within the resistance against that sort of uh, resolution. And by the way, that makes me um, want to bring up, I'm, I'm trying to create a little disagreement. Uh, uh, I, I, again, to Chantal, I am not sure that the uh, the, the fault line, the frontier that you described in, uh, in liberal uh, democracy slash uh, democratic politics is always between liberty and equality. I think it's also over the meaning of equality. I think that progressive neoliberalism uh, champions a certain thin, truncated notion of equality, which means basically that the women of the professional managerial class should be equal to the men of the progressive managerial class. That's their understanding of equality. It's not liberty. It's meritocracy or something. Let the talented rise to crack the glass ceilings. Let everyone else stay in the basement. Um, so I, I would say that um, these terms, equality and liberty, need, uh, they are stakes of struggle, um, uh, certainly now and probably always within the history of democracy. I, I want only one short remark on this term, populism. I don't think that populism is a very helpful category. There's always some element of populism in democratic societies. It is sometimes more, sometimes less. 
but populism is neutral against the basic political distinction of left and right. It is not a political term, and it is a theoretical, I think, use for nothing. Yeah? Uh, um, yeah, okay. Um, I, my comment uh, is, uh, I, I, is following uh, how it's, a, it's about the uh, populism. Though I do want to thank the, uh, I, I do think that the uh, fellow who raised the question uh, had uh, some very good points uh, that uh, as, as a leftist, uh, I think we should take into account. But um, my, my question is really about uh, Chantal's uh, you know, very interesting paper. So, first of all, I don't think that we can say that the relation between liberalism and democracy is contingent. On, on, on the contrary, all modern thinking, it seems to me, about self-government uh, combines them, and the combination is around the question of individual freedom. They're both about individual freedom, which is the modern project. So I don't think you can just say this is sort of an accidental, uh, you know, contingent uh, relationship uh, uh, li limited to uh, to the West. And that brings me to the second point, which is uh, the point that Hamper made, namely, what uh, what do we really mean when we talk about populism? And here, I would say there is really a difference, as I hear it, between Nancy Fraser's uh, presentation and your presentation, Chantel, because I wonder why we wouldn't consider the alliance, in, um, especially in the United States, between neoliberalism and feminism that is 30 or 40 years or 50 years old. I wouldn't, why is that not populist? Uh, it has the idea of, uh, you know, the, the underdog, it's, it's, uh, it's an agonistic, it creates a, a very strong we. Uh, it is, uh, as Nancy says, it is, uh, in some sense, uh, benefits the elite, but no woman would deny that her life has been transformed by feminism in the last 30 or 40 years, I don't, I don't believe. Why is the alliance not just Obama, but uh, that, uh, you know, started with the civil rights movement between blacks and other minorities and liberalism, why is that not, uh, not populism? Why is the alliance between immigrants and globalization in the United States? Why is that not populism? So maybe populism just has to do with nationalism. Maybe what makes the Trump movement populist is not all things you say, the agonistic and so forth, but simply that it is about a nation. Uh, so that's just my question. What is really the relationship between Nancy's and liberalism and your conception of populism? Okay. Okay, Maybe well, you, yeah, you well, uh, we, we, well, look, the question is that, and I, I indicated, I, the way I understand populism is I draw it from the distinction that Ernesto Laclau proposes between uh, its establishment of a frontier between, uh, on the, the political frontier on the term of the, the, the people versus the establishment, okay. Uh, uh, and according to that definition of populism, you can't say it's, uh, all those things that you say, why can't they be called populist? Yeah, maybe. I mean, according to other, but not according to my definition. I mean, this is why I, I, my definition, I mean, according to the way in which Ernesto Laco proposed to call that populism. And if I propose a left-wing populism, it's a left-wing populism that is understood on the basis of that analytical distinction between populism. So it, it's, of course, I know, for instance, Jan Werner Müller, who is becoming so popular in France at the moment, is, is saying populism is necessarily something which is anti-democratic, anti-pluralist. And he gives an exa example, for instance, uh, Erdogan or, or, or uh, Orban. And when one says to him, okay, but there are some left-wing populism, uh, po po uh, Podemos defines itself as a left-wing populism. Ah, it's, ah, no, those are not left-wing left even. So I don't think, you know, it's, it's, of course it all, all depends. Concerning the... the, the, the um, 
Okay, so I mean, Nancy, well, I, I, so I don't know, I know, I know, maybe uh, I should not say that, it's not a secret, but before uh, we had a conversation in which I was asking to Nancy, but you speak about progressive populism. I mean, will you and, uh, uh, agree that it can also be called left-wing populism? And Nancy told me, yes, yes. 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 I do. So I don't I think that we've that. got a disagreement. <laughs> ah, okay, so... <laughs> So we agree on that. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, uh, you know, in, in my idea of, of, of trying to sort of break up this choice between progressive neoliberalism on one side and reactionary populism on the other sort of suggest, if you sort of combine, make a linguistic uh, re-amalgamation, that you would end up with something like progressive or, if you prefer, left-wing populism. From my point of view, that's a good thing. That is a, a, a realignment of the whole political field. It, what, whether it's the ultimate answer and should, in the end, be transformed into democratic socialism or something else is another question. But it's, at the very least, a positive realignment of the political field. And the comment is, I loved the sort of grand historical narrative, particularly from Hauke and Nancy. But then I thought, hang on a sec, this is a very core narrative. This is not a narrative which includes South America, for example, over the last 15 years, where social protest very much became political transformation. It also doesn't include the European periphery. It doesn't include Iceland, Ireland. Greece, Spain, Portugal. So there's a question there about the inevitability of the picture you present on the basis of the cases you're talking about. But then, and I think this is this relates to what Chantal has to say about the famous, there's also a question of we shouldn't just stop there and go, we need this. We're actually at a point where we can go, we've had all of these things, none of them maybe are quite what we need. So can we be a little bit more specific, perhaps, not simply gesturing towards a left populism, but um, we've actually had quite a few left populisms, some of them even in power. Where do we go next? What went wrong? What is credible in our present moment? Do you want to? Uh, I mean, uh, I, 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 I agree with Nancy's point here. Uh, she made about left populism, but I would not. Uh, 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 I think that populism is not a helpful category because this leftist po po politics, which is called now leftist, left, in, in, usually in den, den, to, to den, denounce it, yeah, a left populism is a complex politic that is has populist elements, yeah, for that it is, and, and, and a lot of other elements. Yeah, and, uh, uh, and a lot of other dimensions uh, that 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 are not covered by that category. Yeah, and that I think this is very important. And uh, uh, the, the, the term populism uh, became in the public debate. Yeah, through uh, yeah through uh, a kind of monopoly that the third way. Yeah. The, what you call progressive uh, uh, neoliberalism, yeah, polemically, uh, that this uh, uh, progressive neoliberalism tried to monopolize, yeah, and they call everything that is uh, uh, deviating from their position, yeah, uh, and their power uh, uh, position, uh, and, and every opposition against them, populist, yeah. And that is very simple and very easy, yeah. And that, and, and it is neither theoretically helpful, and is, I mean, in a way, politically, it is, it is more disastrous than, than we should just speak politically of left and leftist and democrat leftist uh, parties or leftist movements and leftist uh, 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 political positions, yeah. Uh, and left and right, these are good categories still, yeah? <laughs> and, uh, and, and government and opposition and democ 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 democracy, yeah? But uh, because 
Okay, that's it. <laughs> Um, Thank you. Can I just make a, a quick comment? Yes. I, I appreciate this question, and I realized because I um, was going so fast that I did not um, speak about uh, various uh, other regions, including Latin America and the European periphery. But I, my aim is not to have a narrative about the core, but a narrative about core periphery relations and semi-periphery. And um, I would say that um, Latin America, and uh, Chantal is a more, much more of an expert uh, than I am, um, represented uh, a, um, an early front against neoliberalism, yeah. probably because neoliberalism was introduced by US-backed military dictatorships and had a bad odor because of that association uh, much earlier. And um, and so we did get, you can call them left-wing populist and, and anti-neoliberal regimes, which, um, as we know, um, you, you know, the, the so-called pink tide has, you know, been, uh, been ended in one, one case uh, by means of a judicial coup d'etat and, and other kinds of coup d'etat. Okay. Um, what do I, uh, lesson do I draw from that? It has a lot to do with the drop in commodity prices, the use of the revenue from during the high uh, commodity price period for redistribution, but not real restructuring. That's an interesting and important lesson. And so I would say the lesson in general is you can't have anti-neoliberalism in one region or one continent. It's too tied to the world economy. And I would, uh, I think that the story of the Euro European periphery, the, the poster case being um, Greece, is uh, the absolute textbook example of the sort of shift in the economy polity relations that um, that I was trying to describe this uh, story about the uh, <laughs> kicking out of the, the Greek finance minister because it's not illegal. That I hadn't heard that before, but that's a, an amazing uh, story, which uh, to me is exemplary of this whole shift. Yeah, this is a leading, yeah. a leading political decision organ, which is absolutely informal. It is no legal institution. Yeah. We still have uh, one question in the back, yeah? Okay. Who has the mic? My question is very, very okay. short. Okay, That's good. <laughs> has to I really love keep the them idea short. that progressive neoliberalism has been digging its own grave. But what about if it has also followed out the tools to overcome? Yes, yes. Because, yeah. I mean, on a macro level, neoliberal templates have followed out institutions such as education, which we would need to figure out what are post facts, what is post truth. It has followed out non utilitarianist individual practices that we would need, you know, for solidarity, for open deliberation, and so on. Um, so, for that reason, yeah. my question is are right. we facing a crisis of social imagination? Maybe you could say a bit more about reason level actors mm -hmm. such as social movements since Occupy had waned. The Arab Spring in most countries has seen a weight in a way to something else. Where are the places, um, the nodes that we can sort of activate that new social imagination to create those futures that we want? Merci. Mm -hmm. Who wants to answer? I don't think I can answer the, the question of uh, where are the, the sort of nodes, the, 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 the places to, um, I mean, I could say some things, but, but what I do want to uh, respond to, is I want to endorse your formulation, which is very uh, uh, close to my own thinking, that progressive neoliberalism has somehow digging its own grave politically. That's the good news. But the bad news is that in the process of its hegemony, it has hollowed out the, the forms of public power that are needed uh, to dismantle it. And uh, without having an answer to that dilemma, I think that's a beautiful uh, formulation of it. And I would say that um, going back to the sort of structural 
side of the crisis story I tried to tell. What is up for grabs, what has to be somehow reimagined today is the whole relation between economy and polity. And I mean, we, that's what neoliberalism has uh, thrown completely out of whack in such a way as to make visible this inherent political contradiction of capitalism. So the question is, is capitalism capable yet again of reinventing itself uh, in some way to reestablish a more sustainable relation between economy and polity. And if Halka is right that it, it, we, it's, there's no return to sort of national Keynesianism, then is, can it possibly do this in, in some transnational way? Or does a new sustainable relation between economy and polity require a transition beyond capitalism? That is, to me, the big question that we face right now. And I'm genuinely agonistic. Let's see, uh, 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 see if we can do it within capitalism or, uh, or not. I'm sorry, we are running out of time. You have a very short question? Or? Okay. How's it going? We can't hear you. Can, the microphone? Yeah. Okay. Um, two, two questions. Ma recherche, mais en fait, c'est trop lointain de ma réalité, c'est trop lointain de la réalité de la plupart des gens dans le monde. Et du coup, ce que je voulais vous dire, c'est que ça, ça c'est utile de placer les savants, ça vous les connaissez bien, c'est une discussion qui se répète, c'est pas nouveau pour vous, venant de cette année. Mais ce que je, je voulais vous dire, c'est que bon, la crise de la démocratie telle qu'on a, que la, que a parlé sur ça aujourd'hui, c'est une crise de la démocratie lue par des gens qui regardent sans recul à partir des centres historiques et coloniales des concentrations des capital. Du coup, vraiment, je, je comprends que c'est utile, que c'est utile pour vous, que ça peut être intéressant pour des endroits où se concentre une partie petite de la population mondiale, l'Europe et les États-Unis. Mais ça serait utile de dire, par exemple, aujourd'hui, le vrai titre de cette présentation, ça serait la crise de, de la démocratie dans les centres historiques des concentrations des capital. En général, et de façon universelle, la crise de la démocratie. Après, normalement, bah, je préfère, euh, par ceux qui ne vous connaissez pas, et pas que vous n'avez pas eu l'intérêt à prendre en compte les discussions qu'on a, qu a partout dans le monde sur la démocratie, du coup. Je vous suggère, au cas où vous ne connaissez pas, je préfère croire que vous ne connaissez pas, de lire Franz Fanon, Rita Segato, Achille Membe, Wani Wani Han. Vraiment, ça pourrait être tourné. Les writers de la Global South, nous devrions être en train de lire. Ça pourrait être très bon. 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 Ça fait partie du système, une logique de la vérité, où pas tout le monde peut parler, et ceux qui peuvent parler, universalisent son propre expérience comme si c'était l'expérience du monde. Et vous allez être beaucoup plus lieu en Colombie que beaucoup de gens qui pensent en Colombie. Et ça, il faut prendre cette responsabilité quand on parle. Parce que le, le, le microphone du monde, c'est chez vous. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh ses conseils de lecture et euh, donc euh, une dernière question One more. Um, Thank you very much for very interesting talks I wanted to shortly ask about uh, the European Union picking up on a question earlier if populism is linked to nationalism or the nation okay. and I wanted to ask in how far the European Union could be home to a what you call the progressive populism. And I'm asking that because today, uh, you may not like him, but Martin Schulz is meeting uh, yeah. the left party and the Green Party in Germany to discuss uh, the formation of a, uh, how we want to call it, a uh, possible new government that's, that's in Germany, news. which again is a question of the core, and I apologize, but uh, might be interesting to consider. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
I think that uh, we are facing a couple of crises in Europe which are specific European and European they are partly reflecting global crises yeah? but they are, have, a, have a core that is genuinely European for example the euro crisis yeah? it is completely absurd institutionalization of this common currency but this common currency holds Europe functionally together even the Greeks did not go out of it not only that the economy, the threat that it would be totally destroyed, but also the, the, the threat that they lose any influence within the bad existing institutions yeah, to build coalitions and so on. They had tried that, not totally unsuccessfully. Yeah? The Germans then finally blackmailed them together with the central bank. Yeah? But, uh, uh, but that was a final step, yeah? That was like sending tanks to Athena. Yeah? They sent bankers. This is the same. Uh, but, uh, 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 but for next time, that will change probably. Yeah? So there, there is some possibility even within these institutions. Yeah? Not so much. But it needs a complete re-foundation uh, of the Union uh, with a real democratic center to solve the problems which even the only institution in the European Central it is the most technocratic institution, that is the Central Bank, that makes law, yeah, that is law what they do, yeah, they, they, their decisions, that is executed in the same moment. Yeah? No separation of powers, yeah, the simple majority of a directory, yeah, a directory of governors. So, uh, and the only person, and so the public discourse is silenced about all these problems. The only person who does not silence is, is Draghi. Yeah? He says, we need something to do against why I am still doing this, this politics. Maybe that's lip service or not, but he says we have to do something against the uh, uh, use unemployment and unem high unemployment rates in Europe because this is a European unemployment rate. All other countries say in Germany, you hear Germany is wonderful, we have no unemployment. Nobody thinks about unemployment but they, we, we cannot separate that because we are this uh, bound together, yeah? winners and losers. The losers lose more and the winners win more. Yeah? And that is a situation that can only be changed within Europe, and that needs democratic institutions that can decide. Yeah? And that is a problem. Yeah? That needs really state power on the European level, to say it bluntly. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think uh, we have to stop here, so thank you very much. Uh, except you want to add uh, something, no, 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 Chantal? No. Are, yeah, it's really time. Uh, we are running very late. So thank you very much to you all. Now we... We, we are, thank you. We all know who we have to vote for now, I guess. Thank you. <laughs>